guys, coming up next, we have a really cool featured guest. Uh, Pete Warner is the co-founder, the big honcho of the Diz Unplugged and Dreams Unlimited Travel out of Orlando. These guys are really a inspiration to the Horrific Network and the stuff that we have done. Um, they showcase multiple podcasts, multiple vlogs, do charity work, really are, in my opinion, the staple of Disney podcasting and video content. And they are uh, a big reason why we exist. So with that, I welcome Pete to the stream. Pete, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I appreciate that. No problem, man. You know, we, if you follow Diz Unplugged, which if you're watching this right now, you know that Pete is on the uh, Diz Unplugged podcast cruise upon the airing of this interview. So we called for questions uh, ahead of time and we do got some pretty good ones for you okay. later on. Later on. Um, but uh the questions the questions never bother me it's the answers that get me in trouble so <laughs> the uh you know the thing when i when i say you really were you know you and your team really were the inspiration for us when we started our podcasting journey it was one channel and it was it was uh, a very simple format of have a guest on, have asked them questions type of typical podcast. And when I found you guys predominantly on Apple podcasting, when it was just a infancy, um, back when the Diz Unplugged was the USB logo. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, it was then like, oh man, now they have a universal show. Now they have this show and now they have, and I'm curious, like, where along the line, when you guys first started this, you know, you've told the story about you and Bob and going into the parks and capturing content, um, but maybe share a little bit about, like, how the Diz Unplug got started for people who don't know. Well, <clears throat> for, well first, thank you for having me. I do, I, I appreciate uh, you letting me, letting me chat with you. No. Um, the, uh, just to let people know, Bob Varley, for whom our studio is named, a good friend of mine who worked for me for many years, who passed away very suddenly in 2006, and, or excuse me, 2008. And Bob, uh, when Bob lived in Massachusetts, he did a cable access show um, that was so bad it was good. <laughs> I mean, it was a cable access show, and it was... It, I, I still go back and watch it just to laugh um, and to see Bob. And Bob wanted us to do something similar to that. And this is now we're going back to 2000, 2001. Hmm. Bob would harass me about doing this stuff. And in those days, the technology just wasn't there. So uh, eventually we started the, uh, the when podcasting became a thing. I decided, I, you know, we wanted to get into it. This was like Bob's dream. Um, mm -hmm. And so we started the Diz Unplugged. Uh, July 29th was our first episode. July 29th, 2006. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, did it audio only for about six and a half years before we brought it to YouTube in February of 2013. And we've been going and growing ever since. What was it that kind of influenced that decision to take it to a video podcasting format? That was always Bob's dream, right? He would, and like he would talk about, we got to do this on video, we got to do this on video. But the technology wasn't there. And what technology was available at that time was far too expensive for us to have done, you know, and it was, you know, really before the days of serious broadband. Mm. Um, so 
but I always had that in mind. I always had in mind that going video was really where everything was headed. And I wanted to get us get us on that, but I wanted to do it right. So we spent when I finally made the decision to do it, I want to say we spent fifty or sixty thousand dollars wow. um on equipment and then took two bedrooms in my house, knocked the wall out between them, and created our broadcast studio. <laughs> the fact that you guys kept going during the pandemic, putting out video content um, via like Skype, like what we're doing or you know anything too. I think the way that you guys continued it was almost like a, a beacon. And I remember you saying um, during that time that like Bob would have kept going, we're going to keep going. Um, and it really was like the, the routine of, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now it's Tuesdays and Fridays for me, because I love listening to Craig and Rhino talk about Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. um, but uh that was something that it was like it gave people something to look forward to in the theme park community is listening to your guys's takes on how they handled everything they being disney or, or universal or anything in your general impression from a consumer from just a theme park fan i thought they both did really well i'm curious with you guys in your team you guys are in there almost every day in some capacity, what was your takeaway about how they handled everything? Oh, I, I, I think they navigated extraordinary circumstances, both Universal and Disney. They navigated extraordinary circumstances uh, as well as they possibly could have. I don't know that there was anything else they could have done other than what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but what you found was two very divergent business strategies between Universal and Disney. Yeah. Um, and in that regard, Universal wins the prize. Mm. Um, they never went, they never went to uh, park reservations. Mm. Um, they were the leaders. Uh, a lot of you know normally it's like disney would do something and then the other theme parks in orlando would follow with the pandemic not so much it was universal who was leading the charge they were the first one to relax mask uh, restrictions mm -hmm. disney followed suit they were the first ones to drop mask mandates disney followed suit um they didn't stop selling their annual passes uh where disney is still not selling annual passes they sold it for a brief period um, Disney has absolutely looked at the pandemic. I call it COVID cover. Um, they've absolutely looked at the pandemic as an opportunity to get away with doing things they've wanted to do for years, getting rid of fast pass, replacing it with a, a paid system, cutting back on entertainment, um, things that cost them money. Mm. And they use COVID as an excuse for that. Universal didn't do any of that. Yeah. Universal leaned into it, and I'm a, I'm a big proponent uh, in business of there are no problems, there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you take, you know, it's you take lemons and make lemonade. Yeah. And that is exactly what Universal did, and they are in a much, much stronger position market wise in Orlando right now uh, than they were prior to the pandemic. And Disney, I can't say the same about, even though the parks are full and Disney's, you know, I'll tell you next quarter's next quarter's uh, uh, earning report um, is going to be uh, is going to be nuts for Disney. It's going to be it's going to be crazy in terms of their park attendance. But I really don't. I really think Universal, if we when when the history is written, uh, Universal won the day, and then with Epic Universe getting ready to open in a few years. Um, they are so brilliantly positioned right now to take serious market share away from Disney and they deserve the success. The 
thing that was interesting because we were just in Orlando. Our spring break is absurdly early. My wife and I are both teachers, and it's more like St. Patrick's break. But uh, we went because we wanted to see for the 50th, and we went to Universal and uh, Disney. And I thought it was kind of interesting because both parks were super crowded. Yeah. But the lines in Universal, I don't know how they're – managing their their flow or whatever but it, it seemed like like a, a 45 minute wait at universal was pretty close to a 45 minute wait and i thought that it was interesting at, at disney world a 50 minute wait posted was closer to like a 35 and i don't know if that is to like try to make people just pay for the genie plus outright or if what the uh, managing expectations or what do you think you're from your experience with that? No, I don't. I, I This was going on before Genie Plus. Okay. Um, where we would hear anecdotally hear these stories about, you know, the post wait time was an hour. It only took us 30 minutes. Um, and I think it's more, and I don't know this for a fact. This is just my guess. But I think it's more um, under promise over deliver. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you get in line expecting an hour and it's only 30 minutes, well, then that 30 minute line was, was, uh, 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 it, it feels good, right? You get on the yeah. ride a half hour early. Right. Uh, but vice versa, if it's posted 30 minutes and it takes you an hour, you're pissed off. Right. So I think they are intentionally overestimating um because they also don't know when a ride is going to go down they and they want their numbers to be as accurate as possible they want to err on the side of caution i think yeah. to do that but i don't think it has anything to do with getting people to buy genie plus and if you hear the stories about genie plus um including my own experiences it's a complete waste of money yeah. it's a complete waste of money it was it was interesting. We were there. My you know my dad has never or had never gone on Rise of the Resistance, and so we knew like for sure we were going to try to get the Lightning Lane so he could experience that. But it was interesting because we went through. Um, we bought it in Magic Kingdom, and it was probably like halfway through the day. We were we were kind of like, huh. Like, is this really necessary? And we did Epcot without it. And it was like, no, it's not. It really no. is. It's not. Oh, Magic Kingdom and Hollywood Studios are two are the two parks where Genie helps. might help. Yeah. Um, but uh, Epcot, no. Ne Epcot, it's a complete waste of money. I think it's a waste of money regardless. But <laughs> just bring what back Fast Pass. Yeah, it's interesting that they have it because the the way that they have done this whole thing and it was really the boarding pass thing with rise of the resistance when it was boarding pass only um it made you know people pissed off who couldn't get a boarding pass mm -hmm. and now with the with the line being open uh you got people that are pissed off because they're waiting for it for you know three hours or whatever so it's almost like a damned if you do damned if you don't yeah yeah. Um, if we can go back to the the early infancy days of Diz Unplug, though, I'm curious when you guys started this podcast, and this is more of a looking at you as as your guys as as the bar, and thinking of people who are starting their own podcast because I get messages and our pages like, "Hey, we're starting this," and do you have any tips and stuff? So when you guys started out. Did you guys have a super structured format where you like I think these are our these are I'm gonna say the answer is no. I'm just by that reaction. But I'm curious, like, cause theme park stuff, like cinema is really like when you're breaking it down, it's like really easy. Like, okay, we're talking about this movie or this guy did this, or here comes this director. Theme parks, there's like an influx of stuff that you could talk about like daily. There seems like there's a ton of stuff that's happening. Well, there are weeks, there are weeks where we have a lot to talk about. And then there are weeks where we're looking at each other going, what are we going to do? Because there's no <laughs> news. There's nothing, nothing happened. Uh, no, in the beginning, um, you know, I chuckle at, at format 
because in the beginning, especially, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what the show would be. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, Bob had pressured me for quite a while to do something. And there were already other people out there doing Disney podcasts when we started. And I said, and I would listen to them, and I'm not mentioning names. Um, and this is where answers get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> they were saccharine and sweet and over the top effusive about Disney. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I just threw up a little in my mouth. I was like, I, I, there's no way I'm going to do a show like that. Yeah. There's just no way. And I would say to Bob, you put a microphone in front of me. I'm going to say things that are going to get me in trouble and it might hurt my business, you know, because here I have Dreams Unlimited Travel, you know, a very successful travel agency. Yeah. Thank God. Um, and, you know, you're going to put a microphone in front of me and I'm going to tell people that, this hotel is crap and that food at that restaurant was awful. And, um, and, and, but eventually I realized, cause I was like, I'm not going to do this until we have a format, an idea that's different from what's being done right now. Mm -hmm. And that's when Bob kind of said to me, well, the format of you saying this hotel is crap and this food isn't any good. That's different. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. So that's when I, I realized that just be honest. Just get on get on the mic and be ourselves. And don't worry about who we piss off. I mean, obviously, we don't want to go out of our way to piss off our audience. Yeah. But in the beginning, that editorial nature did tick off an awful lot of people. They didn't want to hear anything negative about Disney. Was it and just... Sorry to cut you off. I was just going to say, were they, when you say that, were they just pissed because you're saying like, hey, this isn't that great or it's not as advertised or stuff like that? Especially back in those days. How do I put this? Um, people felt, people felt a sense of protectiveness. Mm -hmm. toward disney mm -hmm. um it was very important to them and i count myself among them uh very important to them emotionally their connection with disney and they didn't want to hear anything bad about it mm -hmm. see now for me i can think this isn't good that isn't good but still love the overall product which is how i feel about disney i love disney I'm a huge Disney fan, and I will yeah. be until the day I die. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things wrong. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be changed. And I'm very proud of the fact that our voice has become loud enough that it reaches into management at Disney. And we have helped affect change on some things. Not as much as I would like, but, you know, to some degree, you know, our voice gets paid attention to um, because I try to be fair. Mm -hmm. You know, look, I can get I can really up my views on my show if I want to go off on rants all the time. Sure. People love that stuff. People yeah. love that stuff. Um, and sometimes when my audience is expecting a rant, they don't get one. Yeah. And I try to be fair about it. I try and step back and look at it from a standpoint of a business owner, even though I, obviously my business is nothing compared to theirs, but still, sure. um, you know, I understand running a business and that there are decisions you have to make sometimes that people don't understand, appreciate, or like, but it's necessary for the business. And I try and be fair about that where Disney is concerned because some of the things they do are fair. And I'll give you an example. Um, the reaction to Harmonious at Epcot. Um, and the way people were so visceral in hating that show. Yeah. And I went and watched it. And I loved it. Yeah, I did I too. Thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. Well, it doesn't have a storyline. 
neither did Spectro Magic have a storyline, but you <laughs> lined up three hours in advance to watch it. Yeah. Are you nine years old? You have to be read a bedtime story. Come on. It was entertaining. It was yeah. good. Sometimes, sometimes I don't need to be told the story. Sometimes I just want to be entertained. That's it. I don't want to do any work. I don't want to follow anything. But just entertain me. And yeah. Harmonious, I thought, was phenomenal for that. The technology, the music, the visual, uh, uh, the visuals, just, I thought it was incredible. Um but I'll I'll say things like that. I'll disagree with the audience uh, on things like that, and I'll get myself in trouble. But they no. know they know when, they know when they listen to to us that we're going to tell them what we think the, truthfully, and it's not going to be run through the uh, the filter of you know is this is this what my audience wants to hear, uh, or is this going to be good for my business. Uh, and that was the biggest surprise for me that my business thrived, even though I would criticize Disney. Um, and I, that's when I realized the truth sells the truth sells. How much of that do you think is like a nostalgia factor? Because I would be the first to, to agree with you that going from illuminations to harmonious is like going from a tube television to a 65 inch platinum flat screen TV where Illuminations was great, but comparisonly speaking, like Harmonious was a, a huge upgrade. And no question, no question. But look, Illuminations, a work of art in its own right. Oh, yeah. A work sure. of art. And I miss, I'm, you know, I miss Illuminations. I loved Illuminations. I loved Illuminations so much, I paid to have it perform for one of my parties. Yeah. Um, and that's not a cheap date. Trust yeah. me, it's not a cheap <laughs> date. But absolutely love illuminations but i understand that things need to change things need to change something that marty sklar said to me um when we were doing one of our events with him and we it was during the uh the controversy at disneyland over adding ip characters to uh small world yeah and i said you know marty what do you think of this you know adding adding these characters to that classic attraction. And Marty Sklar did not mince words. He was not a man to mince words, God rest his soul. And he looked at me with this dead look and said, it's not a museum. I'm like, oh, you know what? You're absolutely right. It's not a museum. It's not a museum. It has to change. It has to evolve. That's what Walt wanted that's what the 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 and that's what we all do none of us are the same as we were 10 15 20 years ago we have all hopefully grown and evolved sure um so the parks need to do the same thing in order to remain relevant and because after a while we all want something new we all get excited for something new but disney fans are a tough group we're a tough tough group to to impress but i also think with harmonious the timing of it with the 50th anniversary coming on the heels of coronavirus shutdowns, changes, not just at the parks, in our lives and everything we went through, I think Disney was just a convenient punching bag uh, for that frust that kind of built up frustration. You know, the, the, when I talked to you and Pete, if you don't know, the Diz Unplugged started their own convention in Orlando that we were at to raise, uh, funds and benefit for another great nonprofit, Give Kids the World, based out of Orlando. I and just want to correct you on something. I just have to correct you on something. That event, we are the, we are the host of that event. Okay. Um, that, that was envisioned by, created by, all the work for it, the incredible amount of work for it, done by Give Kids the World. Okay. They do it in partnership with us, but I never want to take credit for that. Okay. I never want to take credit for that. That is all Stephen Amos at Give Kids the World and his incredible team that that put that together. I just wanted to make sure I corrected that. No, no problem. Um, but we talked on the floor during that convention, and I had thanked you for really when I found Diz Unplugged, I was going through the thick of it, and it helped me out. And you said that there are more people that rely on Disney to help them go through the thick of it in the theme park community as a whole 
um, than what people realize. Oh yeah. And I, and I am curious to you, like what, what do you think it is about Disney? And you know, there's of course like the magic and the experiences that come with going and everything, but it does like, you never hear universal is great. I love or universal Orlando, especially compared to Hollywood because it's like a thousand percent better out there than it is over here. But you just like, you just don't hear those stories. Like you hear them when it comes to Disney. What, what do you think it is about Disney that does that? Two words, emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. Disney is a master at emotional resonance. Um, Disney also has a history uh, in popular culture that universal does not. Mm. Um, you know, there's also a storyline about the founding of Disney and the, and how Walt came to start Disneyland and Walt Disney world and what the vision was. There's a whole narrative and storyline to connect with that universal doesn't have. Mm. Um, so I think that's part of it, but Disney, I, I'll speak for myself. Disney is not rides. Disney yeah. is not shows. Disney is, ex, uh, is experiences that I've had over the years with family and friends that are memories I cherish and new ones that I make every time I step foot into the parks. And it's it happens in this place that is larger than life um that is magnificent at storytelling um and i think that is what attracts us to disney that is what connects us to it that is why people relied so heavily on shows like mine and others uh to keep connected to disney when they were physically literally prevented from being able to go there mm. and you know the number of people that have come up to me and said you know you guys got us through the pa pandemic and my response to that is right back at you you know if not for those folks listening and consuming our content we got nothing to do yeah and being able to take our frustration and fear during the worst parts of the pandemic and channel that energy into figuring out how to do our shows in a different way and how to connect with each other in a different way. Um, that saved me. Mm -hmm. That saved me. I lived for the moments where I had to go out live sitting here in my office. The, uh, the fun of getting to create is actually I was having a conversation about this the other day with a, a composer that was on our, our interview show and I was, we were kind of going back and forth and agreeing on the fact that the fun of creating anything in the vein of you know whether it be art or video uh, cinematic to just putting yourself out there on a podcast, to doing daily vlogs, whatever. The art of being able to express yourself in any kind of artistic vein, uh, it is something that is really cool to experience. And once you have done it enough, it is something that you, you it's almost like a, a drug. What the thrill of getting to create something is is a lot of that's half of the fun of it, really. It yeah. it it really is. And you know, you you call it a drug and I've referred to it that way uh many times. And as a recovering drug addict, um I'm well suited to make that comparison. <laughs> um the uh the 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 fun of creating something new, watching it get consumed, getting that feedback from the audience, even when it's not necessarily positive feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but that engagement, uh, that's a real thrill. That's a real thrill. Um, and there's no question, I've had a, uh, I've had a pretty good career the last 25 years. Uh, and at the point that this goes up, 
uh, we're just about a week away from the 25th anniversary of the Diz. Oh, congratulations! Um, I, I've had a I've had a pretty good career uh, for that 25 years, and the show the show without doubt is the pinnacle, the highlight of my career. Was so? Did Dreams Unlimited come before Diz Unplugged? Oh yes, um, I started the Diz in um, 1997. Uh, and I started Dreams in, uh, well, the Diz official, uh, the official birthday for the Diz is June 1st, uh, 1997. It was actually like the last week of May. Okay. But I didn't know, I didn't know what I was, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen when I created the Diz. So I didn't pay attention to what day it was Man. when I uploaded it. Um, so I just rounded it up to June 1st just to make it easier. Right. Um, but uh, Dreams, I remember very, very well. November 15th, 1999 hmm. was Dreams. Uh, July 29th, 19, or uh, 2006 was our, was our podcast. Uh, well, the version of the podcast that we have now, we had tried a different format before that didn't work. Um, but the format that we have now, that started... July 29th. And it's an easy one for me to remember. It's five days after my father's birthday. So, hmm. um, so yeah, no dreams, dreams came well before, uh, well before the uh, Diz Unplugged. On that, on the, on the business side of running a travel agency on top of doing all the multimedia work that you guys do, where are you, um, Pete more focused on? Cause I know, you know, John, is your co-owner with dreams but like you have this fun group of people that work for you but at the end of the day you're only one you're only one guy so how do you how do you personally like manage your time are you more on the the media side of things and john is more on the travel agency side of things or you yeah know? john my 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 job I can sum my job up in three words, heads on beds. <laughs> my job is to get heads on beds. Now, whether that is with the travel agency and hotels or through moving to Orlando, my real estate business and selling homes, uh, it's about putting heads on beds. Yeah. So my job is the marketing. Gotcha. Um, John's job with um, Dreams Unlimited is the day-to-day -day operation of the travel agency because that I would kill myself if <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> I am not your day-to-day -day manager. I'm not that guy, right? I'm, I'm big picture. Um, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm the guy who spends the money. John's the guy who manages the money um, and yells at me, you're spending too much. Um, but um, that's, that's kind of my role. Uh, and fortunately... Fortunately, I've assembled a team of people that really don't need me breathing down their necks. Mm. They know what their jobs are. They do them incredibly well. Uh, I also give them plenty of leeway to be creative and create things on their own. I'll be, you know, I'll give you an, a perfect example. One of our shows that's become very popular is called Off the Rails mm -hmm. um, with the uh, Craig, Rhino, Jackie, and Denny. And um, I found out about Off the Rails when I was just perusing through our YouTube channel one day <laughs> <laughs> um, and saw it. And I said to Craig, I said, you know, in the future, it would be nice just to mention <laughs> that you're doing this. Um, I don't necessarily want to find it, but we have that relationship and we have that environment where they feel comfortable enough. That made me feel so good that they felt comfortable enough to do that. Yeah. That they knew they didn't have to you know, come ask for permission, you know, to wipe their butt. They took the initiative, they created something and it worked and it didn't need anything from me. Um, so it really comes down to the team you assemble and how much you trust them and how much freedom and leeway you give them. And you know what? Make sure you take care of them too. That was my number one job during the pandemic was to keep my staff intact 
and to go to any length necessary to do that. That was my number one job. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that we were able to do that. When you guys do go out into the parks, is there certain days that <laughs> you like to, uh, I guess, for the lack of a better term, come up with like a shot list? Or like you just said, are you guys, you know, camera in hand and you are going to capture certain, you know, whatever is interesting? Not like withstanding like 50th anniversary, obviously you're going into the park to cover all the 50th anniversary stuff, but just on like a, right. on a regular day. Blog. Right, right. Um, you know, everybody has their own process. Um, some of them go in with a very specific idea. I'm going to do this vlog. I need to get this shot, this shot, this shot, this shot. Um, then you have people like me who are a lot more existential in how I approach that stuff. I go in and it's like, what, what talks to me? What, what's jumping out at me? What do I think would be interesting? Now, you know, sometimes because we have so many shows, we have to look at opportunities um, for multiple vlog, multiple vlog opportunities wherever we are. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in Epcot, I'm going to do, you know, I'll do a merch vlog. I'll do a dining review. I might do another type of vlog depending on what I come across. Mm -hmm. um, and dining reviews, dining reviews are the one thing we plan out. We have to. Um, but outside of that, I'm sorry, I have a hair. No. Um, <laughs> it's what I get. It's what I get for having two uh, adorable golden retrievers. <laughs> There's hair everywhere. Um, but now I. I tend to, I tend more so to just kind of go with the flow and see what speaks to me. The dining reviews, I mean, the classic, you talk about wanting Pete, wanting to hear Pete rant. The, I don't know if you'll ever talk the Enzo uh, run the F. I don't think so. <laughs> but like, they have to know, like when you guys now, I mean, you've been doing it for so long and you're so, you got such a, a following. You'd be now, surprised. They'd have to know that you're in the room. Like, you, you'd be surprised. Really? Um, and we can tell almost instantly. I can tell if they know I'm there. Mm -hmm. I can tell. Um, and if I know they know I'm there, mm -hmm. my standard for that, review goes through the roof in terms of if you know i'm here and you know what i'm doing and you still serve me crappy food mm. you're gonna get it <laughs> um but generally speaking like i just had uh we just did a review at wine bar george which is one of my favorite restaurants mm -hmm. um and I know they didn't know who we were or what we were doing there. Mm -hmm. And we had a phenomenal, phenomenal meal. And honestly, honestly, go out of your way next time you're in Disney Springs. Go out of your way for Wine Bar George. Mm. The food is at, it's among the very best on property. And I think it's not given its due uh, for that. I hope our review of it that just went up changes that. But, um, but no, like Marie and Enzo's, when I did that review, they didn't know what we were doing. Mm. And I, yeah, I think that's probably the worst experience I've had at a Disney restaurant. Now, after that review, the Patina group now is very much aware of who I am. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a, a person in the Patina group who's a friend of a friend. And he, the, this guy has like asked him a half a dozen times, any chance we can get him back in there? And my friend mm -hmm. is like, what to poison him? You... <laughs> we uh, were listening to, we were listening to that podcast on a road trip. And my wife was like, man, he does, he is not happy right now. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, maybe it'll turn around. And 30 seconds later, I'm like, no, he, he's not happy right now. <laughs> the first time, the first time in 25 years of doing this, 
that I intentionally went out of my way to drop an F bomb in a review I was doing. <laughs> and literally as soon as, as soon as, cause that I said that that's how worked up I was. And I said that. And then afterwards fiasco said, okay, we got to re-record that. And I'm like, no, you're leaving that in. Just bleep it out. Just bleep it out. But we're not changing it. I want people to know that's how strong I feel about this. Run the F away from this restaurant. <laughs> I also thought my my line about uh, Enzo's hideaway mm -hmm. was named named that because Enzo was trying to get away from Maria's crappy cooking. Um, <laughs> I, I, I I appreciated that line too. How do you? But you just mentioned Corey. Corey seems like he's always with you on the food reviews. Mm -hmm. Craig, I know, has a, a you know a personal relationship with Universal. He's shared that on the show a few times. Mm -hmm. How do you guys like delegate who goes on what show? Or is it all just their choice? Or how do you how do it's, you do that? It's decided um it's decided predominantly by whoever's producing. Uh whoever's behind the switch uh is responsible for uh making sure we have an appropriate number of people at the table. Mm -hmm. So whatever the topic is, you know, obviously if we're doing a show like, uh, you know, did, did one, did a DVC show on a recent trip I took to Alani, um, the people who were on that trip with us, uh, some of the people who were on that trip with us obviously need to be on the show. Mm -hmm. Um, so it really kind of depends on stuff like that, but I'm usually like for a Tuesday show, I'm usually informed, you know, an hour ahead of time who's coming. Um, cause sometimes it's an hour ahead of time before we know who's coming. Uh, mm. but, but yeah, that's pretty much how the producer decides how that works. When you guys, um, are on social media, our channels and our stuff, like if someone says something in regards to any theme park that is putting something out. And like you said, Disney is the punching bag. It's funny that you mentioned when you guys were starting out how defensive people were of Disney, because now on social media, it seems like it's Universal Studios, at least in our at least in our feed. And that may be predominantly because of you know stuff like horror nights. But man, they go to bat for Universal and they are quick to uh to throw, you know, pitches or uh, tortures and pitchforks at Disney over Universal, even if it's like on a scale of one to 10, Universal scores a 3.5 and Disney scores a 9.5 on an attraction or restaurant, yeah. what have you. Have you like, that trend is, is interesting to me that people are acting in that, in that manner. Well, I'll be honest with you. You're talking to someone who, uh, is probably in that group to a certain degree. Um, and I, I feel I feel that my opinion on Universal is a fair one mm -hmm. um, and a considered one, but you know, I've been doing business with Universal for many years. Um, I think it is incredibly well run. I think the pandemic showed how adept, competent, um, and in and here's the big one here's the big one where universal has it all over disney in touch with the needs of their audience mm -hmm. disney is in touch with the needs of their shareholders universal is in touch with the needs of their audience and they adjust their product to suit that you're talking about a collection of the best hotels in orlando run by lowe's which is if there's a lowe's hotel in a town I'm traveling to, that's where I stay. It's not just Universal. Lowe's runs an amazing, amazing property. And it was brilliant the way, and I think Disney needs to do the exact same thing. I think brilliant the way Universal outsourced those hotels to a third party to run because they knew that wasn't their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. That wasn't their wheelhouse. And you have a company like Lowe's that runs great hotels. Let's let them do it. Um, and I think, honestly... Frankly, Disney needs to do the exact same thing. Um, but, I, you know, 
Portof- I, I will take Portofino Bay over the Grand Floridian every day, any day. Wow. It is a better property. It is better run. It is better quality. And it's half the damn price. Is Portofino the one that kind of resembles Riviera? Uh, Riviera resembles Portofino. Well, yeah, Portofino came <laughs> first, but the same aesthetic. Um, it, it is, but uh, Portofino, uh, Portofino Bay, uh, based on the town of Portofino uh, on the Italian coast. Uh, and if you Google Portofino, Italy, and look at the pictures, you see what an incredible, incredible job uh, Universal Creative did in recreating that shoreline of Portofino. Uh, absolutely stunning. But beyond that, beyond that, you have a product, the rooms, the bedding, um, the service level far exceeds what the Grand Floridian offers. And that's Disney's flagship product. Mm-hmm. That is Disney's flagship product. Portofino Bay is my favorite hotel in Orlando, and that is based on years of staying there. Wow. And I'm not inclined to give Universal a nod over Disney or Disney a nod over Universal. Yeah. I'm just inclined to say what I think based on my own experience. And honestly, get get a hotel at Universal, rent a car, because you're going to save so much money <laughs> and have such a better experience. Rent a car and drive down to the parks and back. It's interesting that you say that because that's literally what we have done the last like three times we have come. Um, not a bad experience, is it? Not, no, not it's so not. Terrible. It's I mean, not. look, I four, I four can be a nightmare. <laughs> I live here in Orlando. I four can be a nightmare, but I will t- for the amount of money you save. Yeah, My, and the value, the value of the product you get at Universal with those hotels far exceeds, far exceeds what you get at Disney. And this is somebody who sells millions and millions of dollars worth of those hotels every year. My family, we have DVC. My mom's twins brother, he, every time they go to Orlando, like he will not leave the bubble. And when my wife and I started going to Orlando, just she and I, I'm very much team Halloween Horror Nights. So I want to go back and forth. And so we do yeah. we do rent the car. And there's a ton of stuff in Orlando to see and do. Yes, there outside, is. Outside of Disney or Universal, which you would you will never get to see unless you go outside of that bubble. Um and uh the way that Orlando is laid out. Uh, it's not the theme park capital of the of the country, if not the world, for no reason. Like there's literally like driving through Orlando from, you know, Disney Springs to City Walk, you're going to run into a couple dozen fun things that you could pull over and do. That's right. And, and uh, you know, with that, my my question is, we're now on the 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 brink at least it feels like as a consumer that themed entertainment is about to make the next great leap in the evolutionary scale with star cruiser coming out and your guys' blogs of covering it is <laughs> like a deep eye roll right there. Um, <laughs> the uh, vlogs you guys did look great. We're going this summer. I'm excited. My wife, not so much, but I'm excited. The, yeah, I'm there with your wife. <laughs> the, uh, but the, I am super curious because a lot of the, the a lot of the talk of people who have gone actually gone say it's a blast, and I'm curious for you, your experience in really covering this and studying it. Do you like foresee maybe Universal trying to dip their toes in something similar like Potter esque since they they've got that pretty much nailed? Uh, okay. You know, give me a Harry Potter hotel. Give me a Harry Potter hotel that's yeah. done like that. I'm all in. Okay. I'm all in. And I'm a Star Wars fan. It's not that I like hate Star Wars or anything. I just I don't like the whole cosplay aspect of it. Gotcha. Um, that doesn't appeal to me. 
Yeah. That doesn't appeal to me. I don't feel like dressing up. I don't feel like playing a role. I don't feel like doing any of that. If I wanted to do that stuff, I'd have been an actor. Um, <laughs> and I know that there have been, you know, you know, generally very favorable reviews of Star Cruiser. Um, and bookings have been brisk. I just don't think it's a sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are going to come back over and over and over again to Walt Disney World to spend that much money for that short amount of time yeah. on Star Cruiser. I don't think it's a sustainable business model, and I think we're two years away from seeing discounts on that. I think that's why we wanted to go because we were talking and it was like, are we two years away from discounts? But along with the discounts, does the experience in itself get cut mm -hmm. in half? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm all I'm all but certain. I'm all but certain because this is what Disney does, and Disney does this when. Okay, I'll give an example. When uh, be our guest restaurant in the Magic Kingdom opened, mm -hmm. phenomenal, phenomenal restaurant. And on that opening night review, I said, I hope they don't do what I think they're going to do, which is this is going to become ridiculously popular and they're going to cut back on the quality and cut back on the portions. And that is exactly what they did. They raised the prices, cut back on quality and portions. That's going to happen with Star Cruiser. That is going to happen with Star Cruiser. If it maintains any level of popularity at all, they will cut back. They'll look to make more money. They'll raise the price. They'll cut back the experience. You mark my words. Mark my words. But I don't think, I think what's going to happen is they're going to have to cut the price yeah. in order to attract people in there. Because I don't think, I think it's a one and done. Yeah. Unless they change and, the story or whatever. Yeah, they can change up the storylines. They can. I think there's any number of things they can do. There's a part of me that says, because I'm so negative towards Star Cruiser, that I almost need to go do it. I almost need to go do it. First of all, that would be a vlog. <laughs> that would be a vlog. Um, Pete does Star Cruiser. <laughs> um, because I refer to it as the Hotel Ishtar. Um, and do you know the reference for Ishtar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, because I usually have to explain it. Um, but the, uh, I, I, part of me thinks maybe I should just go do it. And then I think about it and I'm like, oh God, that sounds so awful. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to spend my time doing that. Um, I gotta say, like Rhino, Rhino, I'm gonna be like Rhino. Rhino's on those vlogs. He looked like he was having the time of his life. Kid in a candy store. <laughs> the uh, the way that uh, Orlando, as far as like social media buzz and everything, it always seems like it is Disney or Universal, and. You know, SeaWorld, Bush Gardens, those guys are kind of always on the outside looking in, no matter how hard they try. What do you, what is the major disconnect do you think between those top two and then everybody else? Because the gap seems like it's pretty substantial. Well, I can't speak to Bush Gardens because I've never been to Bush mm -hmm. Gardens. Um, SeaWorld was always. I, and I absolutely love SeaWorld. Don't get me wrong. SeaWorld was always the little brother trying to hang out with their cooler big brothers. Yeah. Um, and, but always had a very solid product and still does, in my opinion. Uh, Blackfish, the documentary, yeah. uh, is what really damaged SeaWorld. But, you know, they're still, they're still chugging along. This, and I'm telling you, you want a day without crowds? You want a day in an absolutely gorgeous park? Go to SeaWorld. Go to SeaWorld. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. 
they had us out for they just did hollow screen this last year first year that they did it and it was almost we were talking it was almost a shame that they the park was really cut in half because all the haunt stuff was on the opposite side of all the animal stuff understandably yeah but uh um it did look nice I mean, we've gone to Bush Gardens and Bush Gardens, it felt, uh, I guess, dirty is the nicest way to describe it. Like, comparisonly speaking, it felt like the less lesser maintained park. Um, mm, that's a shame. Compared to all of them. And we have a, out here, we have a Six Flags and it's kind of the same the same vein as like comparisonly speaking you nailed it with the the little brother trying to hang out with the the big brother type of a thing right um the uh the way as we gear up going into summer and then fall we're only a couple of years away from universal really like if they have already but they really really are going i think to make it a boxing match when that epic universe opens. oh yeah oh i'm so excited what land are you most excited to see are the rumors? oh nintendo 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 nintendo, nintendo. <laughs> i'm gonna yeah. lose my mind i'm going to lose my mind All the and, and, the... and i'll tell you what if japan was open to yeah. tourists yeah i i'd have already been over there i'd have already been over there yeah, that was one of those things. I was graduating from college when the pandemic hit, and it was literally my trip that we were going to take was going to Japan, and uh, the world said not so fast. But uh, the uh, Nintendo Land vlogs and videos from over there look pretty uh, on par with uh, Potter or Galaxy's Edge. I'm so, so so excited for <laughs> nintendo i'm so excited i think it looks amazing <clears throat> when that park opens do you think that the shift in the tide happens i think the shift in the tide has already happened oh wow okay i think it's already happened I think everybody gave Universal a second look during the pandemic and they like what they saw. And I can just speak, I can I can tell you without giving numbers, my sales of Universal uh through my travel agency mm -hmm. quadrupled between 2019 and 2022. Holy quadrupled. Smoke. Holy smokes. And they and they were pretty substantial before that. Now and my what? audience is predominantly Disney. That means yeah, well, like, as I said, the uh, I, I was talking about how our our business had had quadrupled. Um, so let me give you an edit point. You're editing, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I was I was uh, just about to ask if the uh, numbers on Disney, how they have the last three years, what have you noticed compared? If Universal is is uh quadrupled what was disney like disney has i mean disney's up mm -hmm. but we're not talking triple digit we're not talking the kind of numbers i'm seeing we're not talking the kind of growth numbers i'm seeing on universal obviously my disney sales are significantly higher mm -hmm. than my universal sales are uh, Disney Cruise Line, Disney Disney Cruise Line had our best year in sales last year, wow. and I didn't have a and and the product wasn't going, um, the product wasn't operating uh, for more than half the year. Yeah. Um, so, but as far as the tide turning, I think again when we look back, what we're going to see is that the pandemic brought people to a place where they gave Universal a second look. And then as Universal is kind of leaning into that second look and getting a chance to get their hands on a fresh audience, they're going to open up Epic Universe and that's just going to seal the deal. Mm -hmm. That's going to seal the deal. And uh, I think, you know, and especially 
you know, and I, I say this about Nintendo. Think about who the audience for Nintendo is. It's not 10-year-olds. Yeah. It's 35-year-olds. For sure. And it's predominantly 35-year-old dads. You're going to see split stays between Universal and Disney World go through the roof when that opens because mom is going to want to take the kids to Disney World. Dad is going to say, we're spending at least two or three days at Universal, so I can go to Nintendo Land. Um, I'm I, I'm I'm a hundred percent sure I'm right on this. We're going to see split stays go through the roof, but that in and of itself, we've already seen split stays. There was a time you couldn't get a Disney fan to step foot on Universal property, mm-hmm. and then prior to the pandemic, we were seeing a lot more split stays happening. Um. And I think you're going to see that trend increase and grow. I think Universal is really, really well positioned. They handled the pandemic well. Um, they handle their parks and their resorts well. Um, they get it right with Epic Universe. They're in good. They're they're in good uh, a good shape. All right. So we got some cool questions. I will start with the easier ones, and we'll work our way to the more uh, thought provoking ones. Charlie on Facebook wanted to ask you, what is your favorite Disney movie, both animated and live action? Oh God, I hate this question. <laughs> uh, animated, animated is Beauty and the Beast. Um, the it, it, when I really discovered Disney World as an adult, because mm-hmm. I'd never been as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, Beauty and the Beast is what was in the theaters. Mm -hmm. Um, and I saw it and it just always kind of brought that connection back for me. So, uh, beauty and the beast, but, um, also a very close second right now is Encanto. I think Encanto was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. I, I loved it. I've seen it three, I've watched it three times already. Um, as far as live action Disney movie. Trying to think, I don't pay attention to their live action. (laughs) But I'm trying to think of like what they have done. I guess like the Jungle Cruise is like the most recent one that I can think of that I've seen in the theater. But yeah, you know, I'll I'll have to say none of them, none of them really jump out to me. So I don't know that I have a favorite live action. Um, Drew from Snack and Flick Podcast said, do you think we will ever see an original attraction happen in a Disney park again? Under- understandably, all current rides and lands being built are IP-based. That's Not in our lifetime. No? Not in our as, lifetime. As interesting at uh, the Diz family reunion when, when Tony Baxter did his uh, his presentation you could tell that he definitely misses the original like development and it being a, a completely original attraction story, all of that. Yeah. No, I, I don't think in our lifetime we're going to see them move away from the marketing philosophy that says attractions need to promote something from the from the film division, basically. Yeah. Um, there needs to be IP in these attractions. Uh, now, with that being said, that doesn't mean it won't be good. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean it can't be original. Sure. But I think the days of that are over. I'd be very surprised. Do you think we're looking at days of more IP integration into the original attractions? I hope not. Yeah, me too. I hope not. But you got to remember, you got to remember, it all started with IP integration. That's true. Okay. Uh, Castle in Disneyland was there to promote a movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. For sure. That's what it was built for. Um, so it, it's. No, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the DNA. It's in the DNA of Disney. 
That's a really good point, actually. That it all started with the mouse. Um, this is a good one. Tattooed Cupcake from Twitter says, uh, what is one ride, land, and restaurant only in California that you want to see brought to Florida? One of each or any of those? I think she was asking one of each, but is, is there something really, you know, the point of it? Is, what in California, California Adventure? land? I wish I, I, I wish we had New Orleans Square here. Mm. Um, I love New Orleans Square in California. Uh, restaurant. Oh. Flame Tree Barbecue. Ooh. Flame Tree Barbecue. Um, you know, I could say Napa Rose or Carthay Circle, but we have excellent signature restaurants here. Um, yeah. But... Those skewers at Flame Tree Barbecue, we have nothing, nothing that even approaches that. Um, so I would say that. What was the other one? Right. Well, I'd love their Pirates of the Caribbean, and I would certainly love the uh halloween overlay the N nightmare before christmas overlay on haunted mansion oh, yeah. um but although the one in tokyo the overlay in tokyo is even better um got a chance to see that when i was out there um ride a ride that i would bring I really can't think of one. I feel like I said pirates. If I have to pick a, if I have to pick one ride, their pirates is so much better than ours. They're, they're, um, the the pirates of the Caribbean in Florida. It feels like they're shoving you the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get off. Yeah, I, I just thought I just thought it, it, it's done better. It's done better in uh, in California. Um. The phenom on Instagram. How long do you allow a show to run before deciding to keep it or scrap it? I don't make that decision based on how long it's been running. I make that decision based on how well it's doing. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't find an audience, if it doesn't find a voice, and we've been very fortunate, there have been very few examples of that. Um, but if it doesn't find an audience, if it doesn't find a voice, if I feel the time is spent, time and resources are better spent somewhere else, mm -hmm. that's really where I make that decision. The uh, show that I thought was cool that you guys decided to bring back recently is the uh, Best and Worst. Yes. That was when, and I got, like, when Off the Rails came, like you said, those conversations are always fun to listen to between the four of them. But the best and well, worst brought, it's the same kind of deal with the best and worst. Those are always entertaining too. Best and worst was a different scenario. Um, it just became, we became too busy. Mm. We became too busy. Um, but I had said to Craig, I want to rework things. I want to host that start hosting that and um because i missed that show i missed that show a lot our last one this is a this was my favorite one uh from higby horror haunt will we ever see a video of pete going through or going to hhn a la craig and rhino well yeah. i've been to hhn i just haven't been to hhn on camera and if they'd let if they let you f let us film me in there that would be hysterical because <laughs> i become a 12 year old girl um but um uh, never say never do you never say never did you get to go for the 30th anniversary last year i didn't i didn't oh. i it every time i planned to go something happened it was a kind of crazy period so i didn't get to go uh with that are you uh 
what was like one of the mazes that just stands out since it's halfway to Halloween? What what are one of the mazes that you uh, kind of reflect upon as being like, damn, they really got me. That was really good. Oh, God. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, honestly, like. <sighs> I'm trying to think. See, I walk, I walk out of those or even walking through them, I'm paying, I'm like, I'm certainly getting scared half out of my mind, but I'm paying attention to how detailed the theming is and That's how well, yeah. how well done these are. And like, how, how, how do they do it? How do they yeah. do it like this? Yeah, my, um, my buddy and I always have the debate scare versus set design he would rather walk through a house that is half decorated but the scare actors are in his face really getting them and i'm more like you where i'm like no when it comes to haunted houses i'm dark ride over roller coaster 100 percent. i'd rather yeah, that's I'd rather, a good way to put it i'd rather feel like i'm in the movie or in the in the thing i'm the guy that is getting shoved out of the room like you're taking too long like go go and uh orlando's halloween horror nights compared to ours in hollywood uh, hollywood oh your it, sucks it's bad man it's, it's bad it uh and they justify the use of the black hallways as a fade to black in between scenes in a movie and i'm just like then the hallway doesn't need to be like 200 yards long <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, the Orlando set design, my God, man, like getting to go. I've only gotten to go a, a couple of times. Now we, we bought passes, so we go out there more often. And it's just like it's a stark contrast between the two coasts and what they, what they are able to produce out there. It really um, is. Well, Pete, man, I thank you so much for taking the time out. Tell you know, everybody – if they don't already know where they can kind of like find your channel, find you, keep track of what everything the Diz Unplugged is doing. Uh, best places to go for Diz Unplugged is youtube.com slash Diz Unplugged. Uh, and there's links there to all my other channels. I won't list them off here because we need another hour or so. <laughs> um, and of course, my website, wdwinfo.com or disneyinfo.com works as well. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out and talking with us and being part of our event, man. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you.